it. As World War II was breaking out and um, countries began to take sides in what side of this argument they were going to be on, several countries decided to proclaim neutrality in the whole thing. The um, United States was initially among one of those, although eventually it got, uh, began to supply uh, weapons and stuff to the Allied forces and then eventually became part of the, the skirmish. But among these, um, some of the nations even right closest to the, uh, all, the, all that was going on, such as Switzerland, Sweden, uh, Spain, Portugal, uh, claimed neutrality in the midst of all these things. The problem with trying to claim neutrality and stuff, especially in the world as small as it is, is that you can't ever truly be neutral. In fact, even in World War II, Spain eventually began to take the side of Germany through all of it. Switzerland, as neutral as they claimed to be, began to give allowances to Nazi Germany to put some things in their country, and then they began to give allowances to the Allies to use parts of their country to do this and the other. And so it's... It's really hard to be totally neutral. Today, Switzerland still continues to, to claim neutrality. They have a military that is there tasked with just defending its own borders. Places like Costa Rica totally demilitarized many years ago. And they depend on other countries for if they were to get invaded or whatever. The uh, United States has openly declared that they, would, that they would be there to protect. So when you claim neutrality, you have to either, one, be totally dependent on somebody else in order to uh, exercise influence in the world for good or for bad. Or eventually, you have to totally remove yourself from the equation, which is really almost impossible to do. Or you will find that as neutral as you want to be, you are forced to eventually take sides one way or another, even in small measures. In Mark chapter 9, you find it in your pew Bibles on page 845, verses 42 and stuff. Um, 42 through 50 is what we'll be this morning. Jesus begins to have somewhat of this conversation with his disciples. Now, a little bit earlier in this conversation, we're going to look at the tail end of the, of the conversation, but a little bit earlier in, in verse 33, they're around the area of Capernaum, and his disciples begin arguing about which one is the greatest of them, of, of all the twelve, you know well, I'm better than you are, or Jesus spends more time with me, or whatever the argument was, it boiled down to who is the greatest amongst us. Jesus quickly settles that argument. Basically tell him, if anyone will be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. The conversation then goes on to a little bit further, beyond the, the pride issue. It goes a little bit further, and John says, hey, Jesus, we've noticed that these people over here are doing ministry in your name, but they're not part of us. Should we, should we tell them to stop? And Jesus turns to him and says, listen, whoever's not against us is for us. And so if they're for us, then let them do what they're doing. Verse 40 says, for the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. So Jesus quickly in, in this, tells them, listen, if, if, as long as they're not causing problems in my name, but it's, you know, if they're out there doing good in my name, then allow it. And Jesus says, because there are only two kingdoms. This is true today. There are only two kingdoms. And Jesus says, you're either, either for one or you're for the other. There is either the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of God. But get this, I mean, there's only two and even further, everything you say and do, think, propose, wear, everything either advances one or the other. Take a moment to think about that. Every single thing that you say, do, think, whatever it is you think you're doing, will either advance the kingdom of God or the kingdom of darkness. There is no neutrality. There is no walking down the middle of the road. Jesus makes this very, very, very clear. And so in the scope of this conversation of the pride issue and the issue of, of these, these two kingdoms of either for us or against us, we enter into a, the, the kind of the conclusions conversation where Jesus is really going to lay it all out there. 
a want radical fellowship really means, and it's going to become extremely personal. Extremely personal. So look, if you would, at uh, verse 42. Mark 9, 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. Now, Jesus had referred to children lit previously in his, in his conversation, verse 37. So he's kind of using that uh, analogy, but he's not just talking about kids. We'll get this thing. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. One of the aspects of healthy biblical interpretation is to interpret the Bible literally. It's one of the first things you do. is you come to the Bible, you look at it literally, and there's two ways of interpreting the Bible literally. One of these ways um, is plain literal, and the other one is what we call a figurative literal. Now, taking the Bible literally is what you mean is you take the words and phrases and statements in their usual, normal, natural sense. In other words, you take it at face value. What it says is what he means. Then there is a, and so most of the Bible you can take that way. Now there is a figurative literal, and you say, well, David, you're mincing words. No, just listen. Figurative literal means that it's a, you use figures of speech or symbolism to convey an idea that is very clear or a very clear concept or a very clear truth. But the idea, concept, or truth that is conveyed can be taken very literally. Jesus here poses the seriousness of sin. Now, we've already seen several weeks ago that Jesus has already declared himself the authority over sin. He is Lord over this issue. He is the Lord who can forgive, the Lord who has the authority over the ability to forgive, like, just as God, because he is God. And so he goes further now in, in this teaching. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin... Now, Jesus is using the kids that he was referring to before, and it's true that we don't need to cause kids, but what to sin. But take this step further. What he's saying is, is he's also now bringing in his imagery of those who would follow him as being his children. Previously in his teachings, in, in John uh, 1.12, John puts out there that if anyone were to receive Jesus Christ, for all those who received him, to them he became uh, to them he gave the power to be called the children of God. Jesus begins to, if you look through the Old Testament, the terminology for Jesus' followers has gone from people of God to disciples of God, fishers of men, and now he is beginning to introduce this family language into his vocabulary. And here he, he introduces then this phrase of children. So, if you were to, and he makes this extremely personal, if you ever causes one of my followers, one of my children to sin, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck. A millstone is one of those things there's, uh, that you use to grind grain. There were two words of this in Greek. One and the two, two variations of this. One was one that a person could use, and kind of like a, in Spanish you call it a, a, a mollete, it would, that you... Uh, you take the, the grinder thing and, and you grind out the chili seeds or whatever and making your chili paste and stuff that you use those things. Uh, they would use them back then to grind their grains. I've seen ladies in the, the ranchos in Mexico use it to, to grind for their tortillas. And so they take the, 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 the corn and stuff that was already blanched in, in, the, in the lime and they take those and grind them out and make all their, their tortillas and cayudas and everything else. My mouth is already starting to water. So... Um, <laughs> So that's one word. There's also a much larger version of this millstone that you have to tie. It's, it's huge. You have to tie it to an animal. And it's, it's this big old rock that rolls. It's been chiseled so that it would roll, and they would, would tie this thing in such a way that the animal would pull this thing in a circle, and you throw the grain under it, and eventually, as it goes around, it would grind the grain into what you want it to be in. The word for the bigger of these is the word that Jesus is using in here. So Jesus is figuratively, literally saying, if you cause one of his followers to sin, if you cause one of these children, and using the, the word from before of just a little child, if you cause him to sin, 
it would be better for you if you would put concrete shoes on and jump into the Rio Grande. Now understand, we say, okay, well, is this literal? Then if I have caused somebody to sin, then I need to go and commit suicide. No. Why? Because we take this in the context of everything else that Jesus has said. Very, very clear, Jesus in Matthew 5 of the Sermon on the Mount says that murder is wrong. And murdering yourself is wrong. And so that can't be it. So we can't take the, the, the plain literal translation of this because Jesus is not advocating for us to go out and commit mass suicide. But what he is advocating for is the seriousness of sin. The seriousness of us causing other people to, to sin. We have seen this before that remember that God is holy. Pure light. And sin cannot reside at all, even in the slightest bit within his presence. Even the smallest of sins is what, has, is what will take, in, in, as we through the chronology of, of the gospel, will take Jesus ultimately to the cross. There is no sin that's too small. There's no sin that's too big in God's eyes. Sin is sin. Sin is totally contrary to God's nature. It's totally contrary to God's holiness. It is the slightest diminishment and perversion of God's holiness. And God cannot abide in the same place where sin is. And Jesus is saying that the, the least bit that of influence that I might exert over someone else that would cause them to deviate from God's holy plan for their life, to deviate from God's holiness into something that advances the kingdom, the other kingdom, it would be best for you to go out and, 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 and to do and for society to for you to do to, to rid yourself you know, for society to not have you there anymore. It's that serious. Again, and understand me and the millions of viewers who view me on Facebook. Jesus is not advocating for mass suicide. But what he is staunchly trying to help his disciples understand is the seriousness of sin. And then it is a personal matter. Now, how do I lead somebody else to sin? Because I'm constantly telling my kids, no one made you do this. But I can't influence them. One thing I have learned as a parent is the seriousness of telling the truth. That even the slightest off or exaggeration, they are going to bring that back to haunt me. But, Dad, you said. And... It's, yeah, I'm going to pay the consequences for that because I either exaggerated it or I didn't tell them the whole truth or, you know, forbid, which I don't think I've done, you flat out lie to them. But you can. You can influence kids because they're watching you. They're watching everything you do. They're watching what you watch on television. They're watching the things that you're reading. They're watching how you spend your time. They're watching everything you do, and they're paying attention to this. Those are just kids. Now, there are brand new Christians who don't know really how to live the way God wants them to live, and they're watching you. Well, if you can do that, then sure, I mean, God must be okay with it. And so it matters what you do. It matters what you say. It matters the things because you have influence. There is not a person in the world that doesn't have influence in some area of your life over someone else. Even little babies have some measure of influence. If you think that's wrong, ask the windows how often they get up at night. <laughs> we have influence. And so we've got to be careful what we are influencing other people into or the message that we are conveying. And so Jesus says, listen, there are two kingdoms. And everything you do either advances one or the other. Now, Jesus, in verse 43, is going to turn the, the, the ship just a little bit because 42 lies in really serious start, uh, contrast from 43 through 48. Jesus is going to talk. He, in 42, he's talking about you influencing somebody else. Now he's going to talk about you yourself. Look at verse 43. It says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. 
It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. For it is better you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Again, Jesus is using hyperbole to make a point, a very clear point. So again, we're going to take this in a figurative, literal sense. We see the, the hyperbole he is making, and we look at the literal point. What's the hyperbole? Why is it? Why do I know that God's not, Jesus is not advocating self-mutilation? Because he's already said that these things are wrong. In Deuteronomy 14.1, Leviticus 19.28 and 1 Corinthians 6.19, it tells us not to deface our bodies or to mutilate ourselves. And so God's already said what not to do. And so Jesus is using these things as to make a point. The seriousness of getting a sin that also, look at, he's using hand, foot, and eye. And all these three things together would pretty much entail everything that comes into your body, everything that you do, everything that you see, everything that you know, everywhere you go. And so he's using three key components of our senses to pretty much demarcate and say this, everything, everything about you, everything you say and do, if it is causing you to stray from God, then you've got to get rid of it. And you go, well, that's, that's, that's extreme. I didn't think Christianity, last week you told me, or a couple weeks ago, that it wasn't about religious, it was about relationship, and it is. What Jesus is trying to help us to realize is who God is in person. And the fact that who God wants us to be as holy individuals, because he tells us, be holy as I am holy, be perfect as I am holy, is not a list of do's and don'ts. It is a passion to seek his ideal way of doing things and knowing that, yes, there is only one way to heaven. Yes, there is only one way that is God's way, and that's the way we need to look to things. Why? Because that's the way that leads to life. You stray away from the way that God wants things handled, and it leads to anxiety, it leads to fear, it leads to problems in your life. It leads to a whole mess of issues that God says, I want you to get away from these things. I have something a whole lot better in store for you. I have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And these things lead to a life without having to worry about all this other stuff. Although fewer people are watching the expression of self-promotion and self-rewarding familiar known as the Oscars. The Oscars do prove one thing. They prove that Americans are seriously engaged in the entertainment world. And Hollywood understands this all too well. Because... What we see then, and you see this, I didn't watch the Oscars, I haven't watched them for quite some time, you, you, you hear in the media the kind of the aftermath and all the things that people said. But you, you see here in the statements that they're making and in the movies that Hollywood is coming out with and the TV shows that they're coming out with, a very in-your-face agenda of the type of lifestyle and the values that they want Americans to have and eventually really the rest of the world. So as California goes, the rest of the United States will go eventually. The laws that the Californians are passing, you will see those begin to pass at some point in our future. You look at every single one that they've passed in history, and somewhere in the United States, someone else has eventually done it. It is a very staunch and a very a strategic and, and now what's happening is, is that if, if you notice, even, even this year, as I was reading through some of the comments and some of the things make, from one person to the next, it was how extreme can we be? And there was this peer pressure to, I've got to be more extreme than the person before me, or I will be criticized that I didn't go far enough. Whether consciously or not, you guys, 
What we watch will seep into our moral philosophies even more so if we are not theologically grounded. And even because you're theologically grounded doesn't give you license to just barge in and jump into some of this stuff. Jesus is telling us, be careful little eyes what you see. For the Father up above is looking down with love. Be careful little eyes what you see. Because it makes a difference. Paul goes on in Philippians 3 to use the analogy of a boxer and an athlete. He says... Christian life is like a boxer and an athlete. They have a goal set before them. And so they will sacrifice things in their life, not because they can't do these things, but because doing these things prevents them from the prize. And so it's not that I don't have liberty to do it. It's that I choose not to because that prevents me from the prize. Do I do things in the Christian life because I want to earn heaven? No, you can't do that. You don't earn heaven. Do I do things in the Christian life because I want for God to love me more? No, God already loves me as much as he's going to love me. But I do things in my life, one, because I love God. And two, because God has a plan to, one, bless me if I do these things. And Jesus tells me, you are blessed if you do these things. And two, because there is a world going to hell, and the things that I do are either advancing that world going to hell, or it's advancing the kingdom of God and the world that sees that God is the answer. And by this, by, only by that, only through Jesus Christ, will they find a solution to the problems that they're so messed up in. In the English Standard Version, they used, went ahead and used the word hell here. In, in the, um, I believe in the King James and other translations, it says that um, it's better to go through life maimed so to, uh, in these three locations rather than go to Gehenna. Just as a, as a, as a point of commentary, the, the Gehenna refers to the Valley of Hinnon, which was just south of um, Jerusalem. Kings Ahaz and Manasseh had used it as a place for child sacrifices. It was a valley. And so King Josiah had proclaimed the area off limits, unclean. It was not to be used. And so it began to be used as a refuge, a place for dumping your dump stuff, as a place for disposing of corpses in Isaiah 66. It became known as a symbol of final judgment. And so people walked through by that. And eventually everybody would recognize, well, that's Gehenna. That's a place of final judgment. That is what is referred to as this. And so as Jesus refers to this, he says it's better to go through life crippled than with two hands to go to that dump over there, to go to Gehenna. And he's talking about hell, but he's also, again, talking about life. You choose to live life however you want to, and I guarantee you a mess eventually. Because it's not what God wants for your life. And it becomes that dump. And so Jesus is using this as an allegory, as, as a statement of, of final judgment. And the end, verse 48 says, where the worm does not die and the fire is quenched. The worm, referring to, again, Isaiah 66, 24, where it talks about um, the worm and the worms just seem to always exist in these places of, of dump. You're always going to find worms there just kind of running around. But also referring, finally, as a place of destruction for your own life. And ultimately, eschatologically, you're talking about end times type thing, a place where the fire is not quenched, where it tells us that the lake of fire does not go out. It is a place of eternal suffering. There are several religions who didn't believe that God would send people to hell, and so they took the word hell out of the scriptures. According to John 3, 17, 18, 19 and following, God does not send people to hell. But we choose to go there on our own when we blatantly refuse Jesus Christ.
Verse 49 says, for everyone will be salted with fire. Again, a, a reference to, to end times. And it talks about two different things. One, Jesus, when he first came, and it stands to, clear, true today, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his mission. It is today. He comes as love. He comes as a forgiving Savior who invites you to come to him so that he might save you and forgive you and help you to live a life of holiness, a life that is, that is abundant. But he is coming again. And the second time he comes, he won't be coming as a saving, loving person. He'll be coming as a conquering judge. Everyone will be salted with fire. Today, those who are without Jesus Christ are salted with the fire of judgment because they are living in judgment and they will persist there unless they, while they are yet living, receive, choose to receive Jesus Christ and forgiveness of their sins. Those of us who have received Jesus Christ are salted with fire because God is, with our cooperation, is doing the sanctifying, the purifying work in our life to make us who he wants us to be so that we might be presented to him as a church that is holy and blameless before him. And so he's doing that work in our life. And in the, the 40 years, almost 41, that I have been a child of God, I can honestly tell you, I have not always been perfect. But the life I live today is a whole lot less worry-free than it was before. Now, it's not trouble-free. I've got plenty of issues. I've got one child who's fixing to be a teenager and the other one who's on an eight going on 14, 30. I've got issues. I've got bills to pay and air conditioners that go out and things that happen. God didn't promise me a life devoid of issues. But as I choose to walk in his ways the, as best I can, I'm not perfect at it. But more and more, they're worry-free. Why? Because I know Jesus is walking with me, and the principles that I have learned to apply in my life help me to get through these things. Now, I know he, you know, he's probably not done with me yet, one, because I'm still breathing, and two, because he still throws issues at me. So apparently I've got more to learn. But that's the point, is, is, is these. But realizing that it is that I am responsible for these things. I need a couple of volunteers to come up, two brave individuals. Okay, Evelyn, please. Shane, you want to come up? Yes, the seriousness of what we're talking about. That sin is a serious issue. Again, there's just two kingdoms. And it's seriously contemplate or ask that when I get up in the morning, that whenever I start my day, that as I go through life, I ask myself, David, are you taking this serious enough? The decisions that you make, the choices that you make, the things that you're going to do, the priorities in your life. And in, yet, yes, it does require some negation. It does require me denying of myself, denying of some of the things that I may think I want. Why? Because it's not going to help me advance God's purposes in my life. And to realize that I have everything to do with this. And the choices that I make, I either walk in sin or I don't. But no one forces me to do this. And I've got to choose how I'm going to walk today. I've got to choose what kind of life I'm going to live because that's also going to influence those around me. 
So I've got to realize that there is an I in sin. It is up to me. And the only way to get that I out of sin, y'all turn your things around, is to replace I with Jesus. Thank you, guys. That's why I went to seminary, was to learn how to, to draw. <laughs> in uh, formal ways, they call that a master's of religious education. We learn it a master's in learning how to color and draw within the lines. <laughs> salt is good, Jesus says. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? The salt of the Dead Sea was a salt that they commonly used there, but it has, the Dead Sea salt is not a pure salt. It's got some other impurities in it that cause it to have the ability to lose its saltiness. So Jesus is referring to that. And if the salt loses its saltiness, the salt can't salt itself again. I can't make myself salty. I can't, if I were to lose my witness, if I were to lose my credibility, if I were to lose my ability to influence the world for God, I can't regain that on my own. It has to come from an external force. Other people have to begin to give that back to me. In this sense, the only one who makes us salt to begin with is the Lord. It comes from Him. But if we lose it, how is it going to be salty again? So Jesus says something very interesting. He says, so have salt in yourselves. And he's already told us, you are the salt of the earth. Now he's saying, have salt in yourselves. So on a daily basis, I need to again deny myself, take up my cross, and ask myself, David, are you doing these things? What, is the, what are the metrics in your life to see that you are doing these things? We've talked here about the necessity of having a quiet time with the Lord, of, of reading Scripture, of reading God's Word, because that's where we get the principles that bring life, of spending time with the Lord in prayer. So David, one easy metric, David, are you doing these things on a daily basis? Are you spending time with the Lord? David, do you have, are you, are you constantly, or at least consistently, talking to others about Jesus? Or have you bought into the thing that we just don't talk religion and politics? I don't care if you ever talk politics in your life, but we've got to talk Jesus. And just a simple third thing. Who are you discipling right now? Who are you investing your life into right now to help them grow in the Lord? If you do not know how to do these things, we're here to help you. We're here to walk alongside you. We're here to show you some very simple ways that this is not, doesn't require you to be a theologian, doesn't require three, four years of seminary. It's something you can learn to do, something that Jesus wants you to, to do. And so they're simple. But it requires us wanting an intentionality about it. Some big words just because I can. S. When I think about salt, I think about seasoning, I think about salt and pepper. So I was like, okay, where's some S and P words we could put in here? Well, S, seasoning. Do you have seasoning in yourself? Do you have savor? The savor of life. And that would be, are you humble, self-denying, obedient, and sacrificial for the sake of the kingdom? <coughs> Salty people do not lose their savor. We've got to expunge from our life that which, which removes our walk with Christ and add to our life that which strengthens your walk with Christ and your ministry. And you say, well, again, the Christian life is not a bunch of do's and don'ts. No, but everything you say yes to in life will require you to say no to something else. You can't get away from it. Everything you say yes to, we are busy people. We have things that we have to do. And anything else you say yes to, you have got to say no to something else in your life because you don't have time for it anymore. To pick up a bad habit, you don't just start doing the bad habit. You've got to start doing a better habit, and that's got to replace the bad habit. You can't just quit. 
And so our life is yes and no. And realizing that when I say yes to something, then I am immediately saying no, even secondarily or even without knowing it, I'm saying no to something else. Y'all seek to bring gospel, which, bring, which gives life. And that's preservation. A fancy word for that would be piquancy. I learned that word yesterday. But it comes from the Spanish word, or it comes from the same Latin as the Spanish word, picoso, which is some spice, some substance to life. Piquancy. I want you guys to go around there and, and, and repeat that word to each other every once in a while. Jesus concludes this conversation. He says, and be at peace with one another. Again, in the light of if you're not for, against him, you're for him. And if, if another church, if God is blessing another church, then phenomenal. Cheer for them. That's what he's saying. Encourage one another. Cheer for one another. That if God is blessing your neighbor, cheer for them. God's doing a work in their life. Support and encourage them. But be at peace one with another. Y'all, the Christian life is about intent and being intentional. So may we be the salt and pepper. But have salt in yourself. And do what it takes to keep yourself salty. Let's pray. Father, I praise you for being a God who makes these things so simple for us to grasp. Albeit, there are things that we cannot do unless you grant us your power to, by which we will do them. Lord, may we have the intentionality of seeking you, of wanting to walk with you, and allowing you to bless us that we might be a blessing to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.